So, that has been happening in Athens, in the city, in the chambers, and in the daylight hours. What happens next is, this scene happens in the wood. And what then takes place is, at the end of that scene that we just saw, Lysander says to him here, all's not lost. You are a criminal here in Athens, if you marry me. So what we'll do is we'll up sticks, we'll leave Athens, because Athens law only extends a certain way, and we'll go out to another place where my aunt lives, I've got a family, we don't live in Athens, and outside of the jurisdiction, you're not a criminal, we can get married there, and we can stay there, and we can be happy. What this says is to you that there is an enclosed situation. This is a place which has been defined by somebody, and its laws are lies. I'm using words here that Eugene uses a lot. He would say that law and lie come from the same root. It's something which is laid down, and it only appertains to a particular place. In other words, to somebody who has defined the situation. The definition of the situation is an Athenian one. And Shakespeare has picked Athens particularly because Athens means wisdom to the ancient classical world. The root of the word doesn't mean that, but it has always been true. We even have an Athenian, we have one, we used to have one in Liverpool. They have one in London. And what it means is a place of learning where people go and debate philosophically. It's a place of wisdom. Now, it is in that sense a defined order. It's a conceptual place. You step outside of that and the laws no longer apply. The laws have established the form of this particular place. And Shakespeare is saying exactly the same thing. If you come out of them, you go into the no place. You go into the anything goes. You go far enough, you go into Sparta, they have different laws. And their laws of marriage were quite fiendish. But here, in between, you can make your own. So you can define the situation and establish it, which is what my son is saying. Let's go somewhere else. Create our own definition and live the way we choose to do it, which was possible. Remember, some of the worst things they could do here was exile people. And in Athens, they used to exile two people that nobody liked every year. They used to have a vote. Who's the worst person in the city? Get them out. Get them out. Which is a great idea. Imagine that. The competition not to be kicked out. Because out here there were brigands and wild animals and you could die. And inside you were protected, there were walls around the place and it was defined and stuff. But you stayed in there, you obeyed the damn laws because you were safe in there. Outside the scurry, inside the safe. But it's a prison. It's a prison and you obey the laws. One of the things I want to draw attention to, which I've sort of tried to draw attention to, is the fact that Shakespeare was able to write like this because he had a classical education. He had the references. So if he wanted to talk about sex without offending anybody, and he does, then what he does is he goes back to the classical roots and he talks about pre-Christian situations. He's actually talking, I mean, Oberon has most of the, the um, attributes of Satan. He puts men and women together and all their values and ask if they're married. He doesn't bother with any of these sorts of things. He's very sort of sneaky. He um, uses magic to distort them, to make them fall in love with people if they don't want. He did make his own rules. He's not like Theseus, he's completely amoral. So he's got most of the attributes of Satan. Shakespeare didn't call him that. He wants us to, to look at him in a different light. He wants us to see him as a chancer and a bit of a gambler and a bit of a nerdy well but also a life on the An interesting fellow, and a complex character as well. So he's giving us, he can do that as long as he doesn't, he doesn't nail him down and say he's this and he's that and he's the other. So he's going to give us lots of qualities. He has lots of quality, qualities of Saturn and of Jupiter. So he's actually created his own character here. So what are you going to tell me? Now this word Oberon, um, it's not a very old word, the time of this, it first appears in the 14th century, and it's a French word referring to the King of Furies. And the King of Furies refers to his only little club. This Oberon is a kingly, lordly chap, he's full size, he's played by an actor, he has to be. 
Titania is a reference to, it, 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 it's actually, it's a Titan. It's a female name for a Titan. This is one of the reasons why we know that he's actually read <coughs> Ovid, because the English translators that just don't use the word Titania, whereas Ovid does. He's using this word as a general thing. This is a female goddess, a powerful female goddess. He's not nailing it down, he's not calling her Venus, but she's got most of the attributes of Venus, some of the attributes of Artemis as well. So, and um, Aphrodite, sorry, rather than Venus, get mixed up in my Latin and my way Greek roots. But so what he's saying is, he's not nailing these down, he's giving us the associations and saying, look what we can do with this. And the furries are not Greek gods. These are homespun characters that you might find in the hedgerow. You know? Peace blossom. Cobra. Moth. These are not great, powerful characters. They're very manageable. And Pop is Robin Goodfellow. He's the cheeky little baby that plays in the farmyard. He's not classical at all. But he has all the attributes in this of Eros, from which we get the rot. This is Eros. Now, we get confused sometimes because the Latin translation of this is Cupid. And Cupid is a baby boy with a bow and arrow. Eros is an adolescent boy with a proper bow and arrow that sometimes kills people by mistake. It's a proper bow and arrow. And he's very mischievous and he gets people into lots of trouble. So the Greeks have got a slightly more mature and disturbing image of what the rot is what Eros is all about, what this erotic impulse is all about. Right, so what's going to happen now is these two are going to run away, and to run away they have to go into the wood. These people are going to rehearse their play. They don't want anyone to see it, they want it to be a surprise. So they want to go into the wood to rehearse. We know these two are already in the wood, and so is he. Helena says, those two go into the wood. She's good friends with Hermia, but she says, now, if I tell Demetrius that they're going to run away, he'll fall in love with me all over again, and we'll all be happy. Do you think that will happen? So Shakespeare is describing here adolescent love very, very well. They're going into the woods. Those two are going to run away. She's going to tell him where they're going to be. They're going to meet in the woods. So this is going to be worse. The only people who are not going to go to are Hippolyta and Theseus until the day of the morning, the morning of their wedding when they're going to go hunting. So, this is the thing which Shakespeare does. He's already told us it's going to be four days till the wedding day. If you don't get four days, you get one night. Okay? When you first see the play, it doesn't click to this, but you've been told it's four days, what's happened? There's no explanation. Except for the fact that people say he's probably talking about some sort of festival time. He's talking about a dark period of no moon coming into a new moon. But he's playing about the time, certainly. Or he's just rushed the whole thing through. He doesn't want it to, to, to lose, the, lose its boil, so he takes the whole thing in one night. So, the magic is going to happen in the wood. Now, what I would like to do here, are we going to have a break this afternoon? Is this a break time? Mm -hmm. When would be a good time to have a break? Right now. Right now? Would you like to do that before we go into the wood? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, we'll have a break before we sit and And we'll come back after the woods in <laughs> 10 minutes. Not quite. Jones has said something here, mentioned about 10 years. And Ted Hughes said a magic thing. He said that it's actually immoral and it's violent to tell people what to do. Yeah, that it actually offends them, and particularly the children. So what you have to do is tell the stories, is what Ted Hughes would say, and that's what he did. He's been saying that, you know, his own one was a wonderful paradigm of how to behave. But, I mean, he said that, and he went about writing, the Tin Man is, is his way of getting across to children, the moral imperatives that we want to get across, but he said it does violence to to just tell them how to behave. You give them a story, and the story draws them in, yes. and they realise. And this is what Shakespeare's doing yes. with us. Yes. He's actually drawing us in, and he's giving us five relationships. 
And he's commenting on all of them. And he's saying, this is what has to happen. Now, we 